Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our Father and our God, what a joy it is to be in your presence. I can't think of any place on planet Earth that would be better to be at than your church this morning. Father, we thank you for the privilege of belonging to your remnant family. And Father, we believe that as we look at the world, that things are unraveling, and the final movements are certainly rapid ones. And Father, I just ask that as we study your word this morning, that you will see, help us see the urgency of the times that we're living in, and the dire need that we have of receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, so that we can finish your work, and we can go home. Father, I ask that you will bless our study together. And we thank you for hearing and answering our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. In the last several trips that I've taken, and in numerous emails that I have received, I am encouraged by what I see happening in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's very easy to see the negative things that are happening. For example, there is a doctrinal and theological meltdown taking place in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There are divisions with respect to styles of worship, lifestyle, and many of the doctrines that we've held since the origins of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But in the midst of all of this discouraging news, there is also good news. Probably most of us who are sitting here in the congregation are unaware of this good news, because most of us probably just stay in Fresno, go to our work, and come to church on Sabbath morning. But I have the privilege of traveling all over the United States and to many countries of the world. And I am encouraged as I see a whole generation of young people that God is raising up to help finish the work in these last days so that we can go home. This last week through Tuesday evening I had the privilege of uh, spending some time down in Miami speaking at the Miami Central Hispanic Church. Sabbath morning the church was totally maxed out. We, it has a capacity of about 750 and they had to put chairs in the aisles. I had a question and answer session twice with the young people. It was amazing to hear the young people, they didn't have to be coaxed into asking questions. They, they simply were spontaneous. Uh, many of them raised their hands simultaneously. We were not able to get to all of the questions. Actually, before I took this trip, I had a young person from Miami send me an email asking me about when Jesus resurrected from the dead. He actually had been checking on the internet and he had found this rather long article where the author uh, of the article was stating that Jesus actually resurrected on Friday evening after sunset. In other words, Jesus resurrected on the Sabbath and therefore we're supposed to keep the Sabbath in honor of the resurrection instead of Sunday. And uh, he was actually, this is uh, the son of an individual who uh, has been an Adventist all of his life, and he was saying, how do we deal with this? The arguments appear to be quite persuasive. So I went to the site that he sent me to and I read the article, it actually is more than an article, it's about forty some pages long, and of course within ten minutes, having been trained theologically and being versed in scripture, I found a whole series of mistakes, uh, theological errors in this document, but I was amazed by the fact that uh, this young person and several others were kind of shaken up by this and, and they were saying, you know, this sounds like it makes sense that Jesus resurrected on uh, Friday evening after sunset, which would be the Sabbath, and therefore, therefore we're supposed to keep uh, the Sabbath in honor of the resurrection. So I emailed him back and I said, you know, 
uh, the arguments appear to be very persuasive how about it if when I go to Miami, he sent me this before I went to Miami when I go to Miami we sit down with our Bibles and we look at this issue and we study it carefully and so he sent me an email back, he said I, I think it's a great idea and to make a long story short, last Sunday we met in someone's home and we sat there for three and a half hours this group of young people uh, there were I think about 10 or 11 of the young people with their Bibles in their hands anxious to see what the Bible had to say about the resurrection of Jesus just this week I received an email from a young lady who represents one of the youth federations in Jamaica and uh, she and several of the young people have watched the presentation worship at Satan's throne uh, now for those of you who have watched this, this is a very politically incorrect presentation about what's happening in worship styles in the Seventh-day Adventist church and you would expect many young people to be offended but she says in her email our youth federation gathered together and unanimously we would like you to come and speak at a youth rally for our youth federation I received an email from England praise the Lord that there's a revival taking place in Europe and uh, in this email uh, the person who uh, I won't identify by name was saying Pastor Bohr we would like, to come, like you to come to England and present a seminar like you do at Amazing Facts which is really a four day course and incidentally I'm going to be there uh, teaching for two and a half days this coming week and we, we have just many young people who want to gather together and they want to study the distinctive message of the Adventist church last night I got an email from a young man at Loma Linda University he represents all of the Hispanics of, uh, of Loma Linda University and he said Pastor Bohr we made a list of speakers we uh, decided to pray to see uh, who we could, we could bring to speak at our annual retreat at Cedar Falls and the feeling was unanimous that we wanted you to come down and speak to us about the distinctive message of the Adventist church preach about the doctrines and beliefs, the fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist church a group of young people in Chicago are organizing to start a Hispanic branch of the General Youth Conference or Generation of Youth for Christ in fact, they've invited me to speak at their first annual convention at Andrews University uh, in the month of May of next year. Uh, it, this is going to be huge because we have thousands and thousands of Hispanics in North America that are going through the same problems that the English speaking churches are going through. I don't know if you're aware of the fact that the Willow Creek Church, have you ever heard of Willow Creek? It, uh, actually Bill Hybels who is the senior pastor of that church was one of the pioneers in the mega church movement, the church growth movement well he had some experts do a study of his congregation to see how well they have done in the last 20 years and these individuals who did the research actually wrote a book which is available where they state by statistical study that most of what had been done at Willow Creek, this mega church in the last 20 years has been a dire failure in di discipling people to be followers of Jesus Christ even out there in the mega church movement they're starting to discover that bigger is not necessarily better that having more numbers is not necessarily good because if we went by numbers the devil's kingdom would have the predominance because the devil has more followers than any other group and so I thought that as we began our study this morning I would share with you many of these encouraging things that are happening among our youth in the world field I believe that there's a great revival right around the corner and it's beginning at the grassroots with the young people folks GYC was not established by the leaders of the church 
GYC or Generation of Youth for Christ was a grassroots movement that was founded and organized by the youth themselves this is encouraging and folks if us adults don't wake up the youth are going to take off and they're going to leave us in the dust so we better wake up because we're living in incredible times you look at the world today I mean there's strife everywhere war everywhere strife in the United States between political parties the world is coming together in rebellion against God and what are we doing as a church? we come and go many times like a door on its hinges now this morning I want to talk for a few minutes about the greatest gift that God has for us you say what is the greatest gift that God has for his people the fact is folks that the greatest gift that God has for his people is the Holy Spirit do you realize that Jesus before he went to his passion in the garden of Gethsemane you read John 14, 15 and 16 immediately before his prayer in the garden of Gethsemane which is in John 17 the burden of the speech of Jesus in all of those chapters had to do with what? had to do with the Holy Spirit I'd like us to turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 here the Apostle Paul has something very important to tell us about the Holy Spirit he says there but you are not in the flesh but in the Spirit if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you and now notice this now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ he is not his how important is the gift of the Holy Spirit? folks if we don't have the Holy Spirit we are none of Christ's according to this verse you're all acquainted with John chapter 3 and verses 5 and 6 the conversation of Jesus with Nicodemus Jesus actually said unless you are born of the water and of the Spirit you cannot see the kingdom of God and you cannot enter the kingdom of God in other words the Holy Spirit is not a luxury the Holy Spirit is absolutely indispensable if we don't have the Spirit we don't have Jesus if we don't have the Spirit there is no way that we can see or comprehend the kingdom of God and there is no way in which we could ever enter the kingdom of God I want to read now a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy it's found in the book Acts of the Apostles page 55 and you're going to see why I mentioned at the beginning of our study today that the greatest gift and the greatest blessing that God can pour out upon his church is the gift of the Holy Spirit and if we don't have that we have absolutely nothing notice this very interesting passage the lapse of time has wrought no change in Christ's parting promise to send the Holy Spirit as his representative in other words the passing of time has not made it any less desirable for God to pour out his Holy Spirit it is not because of any restriction on the part of God that the riches of his grace do not flow earthward to men it's not because any restriction that God puts on it that we don't receive the blessing of God's Spirit she says if the fulfillment of the promise is not seen as it might be it is because the promise is not appreciated as it should be if all were willing all would be filled with the Spirit if all were what? willing all would be filled with the Spirit 
wherever the need, listen to this, wherever the need of the Holy Spirit is a matter little thought of, there is seen spiritual drought, spiritual darkness, spiritual declension and death. Whenever minor matters occupy the attention, the divine power which is necessary for the growth and prosperity of the church, and here comes the key portion, and which would bring all other blessings in its train is lacking, though offered in infinite plenitude. So the Holy Spirit is offered in infinite plenitude. In other words, the supply is infinite. It is limitless according to the spirit of prophecy. And if we had the spirit, all of the other blessings that God has for us would come in its train. Which means that if we don't have this blessing, we don't have any other blessing. So what the church needs most today is the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Now allow me to amplify what Ellen White is saying and let's take a look at the Bible to see if what she says is right. Is it true that upon this blessing depend all other blessings that God can pour out? That if we have this we have it all, if we don't have this we have absolutely nothing. Perhaps it would be a good idea for us to look at what the Bible has to say about the functions of the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit does. And so I'm going to go through a list of functions of the Holy Spirit. First of all, we're told in John 16 and verse 13, some of these texts I'm not even going to read because you know them, John 16 verse 13 tells us that the Holy Spirit guides us into some truth. Thank you very much. I see that you're still awake out there. The Apostle John inspired by the Spirit says that the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. What, what does that mean? It simply means that if we don't have the Holy Spirit we can know absolutely no truth at all. We would not know the truth. We would not be able to distinguish between truth and error if we didn't have the Holy Spirit. Perhaps that's the reason why in a postmodern society like we have today nobody knows what's right, nobody knows what's wrong because the gift of the Holy Spirit is not a reality in the lives of most people in the world today. Another thing that the Holy Spirit does this is found in John chapter 16 and verse 8, if you'll go with me to John 16 and verse 8, we're told here that the Holy Spirit does three things. Not only does He guide you to the truth, but it says, and when He has come, He will convict the world of sin. What would happen then if you didn't have the Holy Spirit? You would feel absolutely no conviction of what? of sin, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness, he not only dwells on the negative, convicts of sin, but he also convicts of righteousness and he also convicts of judgment to come. Nobody would feel that there's a judgment to come or a need for righteousness or a need to overcome sin unless it was for the power of the Holy Spirit. So you wouldn't know you were a sinner, you would not feel any need for righteousness and you would have no respect of the idea of a judgment unless the Holy Spirit was a reality. According to Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 we are renewed by the Holy Spirit. In fact let's read that in Titus 3 and verse 5 the Apostle Paul speaks about the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. Once again Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Here the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says this, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, 
but according to His mercy He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit regenerates, the Holy Spirit gives new life, the Holy Spirit renews us in other words. So if the Holy Spirit was not a reality in our life, there would be no way in which we could be renewed. We're told in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13 that the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. Basically the word sanctify here means that the Holy Spirit through the Word of God makes us holy. So without the Holy Spirit, without the agency of the Holy Spirit, holiness would be something totally unattainable. Holiness is in the hands of the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit there would be no chance of holiness. Romans chapter 8 if you'll go with me. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 and we'll also read verse 14. The Holy Spirit guides our daily walk and gives us victory over the flesh, over that sinful carnal nature that we have. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the what? according to the Spirit. Notice verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God these are the sons of God. And we're told in verse 13 for if you live according to the flesh you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So who is the only one who could put the de to death the passions, the evil passions of the body, the evil passions of the flesh? It's the Holy Spirit. We begin to grasp the idea that Ellen White was certainly right when she said that when we receive the Holy Spirit all other blessings come in its train. Which means that if we don't have the Holy Spirit we don't have any other blessing. We either have Him or we don't have Him. And if we have Him we have everything. If we don't have Him we have absolutely nothing. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5 tells us another very interesting function of the Holy Spirit. It says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by whom? Into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Let me ask you, could we love as Jesus loved if we did not have the love of God poured into our heart by the Holy Spirit. It would be an impossibility. We wouldn't be able to love if it wasn't for the fact that the Holy Spirit is there as a blessing from God. Furthermore, the Holy Spirit changes our characters into the image of the character of Jesus Christ. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. We could probably recite this verse from memory. I'll bet you anything that Randall Lutz could. He's the memorizer here in our congregation. Notice 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, notice, just as by the what? Just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the Holy Spirit is the one who transforms us into the image of Jesus. If we didn't have the blessing of the Holy Spirit, reflecting the character of Jesus would be an absolute impossibility. Allow me to read you this statement, it's in the book uh, Ye Shall Receive Power, it's a book of Ellen White, it's one of the lesser known ones, page 298, she says this about the transforming power of the Holy Spirit to change our life. When the Spirit of God takes possession of the heart, He transforms the life. What does He do when He takes possession of the heart? He transforms the life. Anybody here want a transformed life today? You know most people are going today to psychotherapists and they're, and they're taking antidepressants 
because they want to have a new life, a life of peace and a life of joy. Well I have news for you, if you have the Spirit you will have joy and you will have peace. If you don't have the Holy Spirit you will have neither of the two. No matter how many antidepressants you take, no matter, no matter how many uh, psychoanalysts you go to, if the Holy Spirit is in the life there is peace and there is joy. Notice what Ellen White continues saying, when the Spirit of God takes possession of the heart He transforms the life. Sinful thoughts are put away. What happens when we have the Holy Spirit? He possesses our heart. Sinful thoughts are put away. Evil deeds are renounced. Love, humility, and peace take the place of anger, envy, and strife. Joy takes the place of sadness and the countenance reflects the joy of heaven. No one sees the hand that lifts the burden or beholds the light descend from the courts above. The blessing comes when by faith the soul surrenders itself to God. Once again the blessing, that is the blessing of the Holy Spirit, the blessing comes when by faith the soul surrenders itself to God. Then that power which no human eye can see creates a new being in the image of God. Wow! Higher than any of the, than the highest thought that you can think is the ideal that God has for His people. God likeness, likeness to Christ and when you have the Spirit, the Spirit writes the character of Jesus Christ in our lives and we have joy and we have peace and we have the virtues of the Spirit in our lives. Let's look at a few more functions of the Holy Spirit so that we see that unless we have this blessing we don't have anything. The Holy Spirit of course you know helps us understand the Scriptures. See the Holy Spirit gave the Bible. So the only way in which we can understand the Bible is if the Holy Spirit who gave it comes and explains the Bible to us. The unrenewed mind cannot understand the Bible because the Spirit is absent from the unrenewed mind. That's why we're told in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 that the sword of the Spirit is what? The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Listen, some people think that uh, you know if you just pray for the Holy Spirit somehow God miraculously by some uh, power that flies through the air is going to go into your heart. The fact is that the Holy Spirit never works independently from the Word. He always works through the Word. That's why we have to be in the Word. You know somebody was telling me this morning, Pastor Bohr, you know why do we commit these sins over and over again? Why in, in spite of the fact that we struggle and we want to gain the victory over sin, why do we repeat the same sins over and over again? I told her the reason why is because we're not spending time at the foot of the cross contemplating Jesus as he's found in scripture. You know Ellen White has told us in Desire of Ages that it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day contemplating the life of Christ. Especially the closing scenes. And she says that as we contemplate the closing scenes of the life of Christ in Gethsemane at Calvary and we hear Jesus saying to the Father, Father this cup can pass from me, let it be so, nevertheless not my will, but your will be done. When we come to the cross and we see Jesus, we hear Him saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we reflect on that, I'm not talking about reading it, I'm talking about sitting down, reflecting on it, assimilating it, thinking about it, recreating the scene in our minds so that it lodges in there, when we spend time at the foot of the cross and in Gethsemane we ask Jesus, Jesus why did this happen to you? And Jesus says the wages of sin is death. This is what sin causes. If we spent time at the foot of the cross folks we would want, not want anything more to do with sin because we would see what sin did to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The trouble is we're too busy. We're too busy on things that, that you know are not bad in themselves we're caught up in the routine of life, we're busy, you know when we're offered for example a position in the church, say I can't do that, I'm too busy, 
I have two jobs. I have a, a family to take care of. I have a house to clean. I have, I have this to do and that to do. And so we're so busy that we don't have time to sit down and reflect and assimilate the character of Jesus through Scripture. By the way, do you know that we assimilate the flesh and blood of Jesus through the study of His Word? That's what Jesus meant when He said, He who does not eat my flesh and drink my blood will have no life. But if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have everlasting life. What Jesus meant is that through His Word we assimilate the very life of Jesus, folks. In fact, He explained, He said, the flesh doesn't profit anything. The words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. So if we didn't have the Holy Spirit, there's no way that we could even understand the Bible. Furthermore, furthermore, the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. Do you know that you couldn't really, you couldn't really pray without the aid of the Holy Spirit? We wouldn't know what to pray for. And we would pray for the wrong things. Let's notice Romans. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. Here the Apostle Paul is addressing the importance of the Holy Spirit in our prayer life. Here the Apostle Paul says, Likewise the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. We don't know, even know what we're supposed to pray for. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And verse 27 says, Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. We would have no way of knowing what to pray for. We would be praying for the wrong things. We would be approaching God in the wrong way if it wasn't for the power of the Holy Spirit. You're all acquainted with the text where uh, this is in Mark chapter 13 where it's talking about the end time that God's people will be taken between, before kings and before rulers. I believe that this was fulfilled with uh, Steve Wahlberg going over uh, and speaking at the Pentagon and, and, and at the Senate. Isn't that an amazing thing? You know, it's planting seeds of truth in the minds of those who, who are hungering and thirsting for something better than they have. You know, most of our, of our senators and most of those who are in the House of Representatives don't have the foggiest idea how to solve the problems that exist in this country and in the world. They're totally confused. But if they could just sketch the picture of what's happening, where this is leading to, they would make much, much wiser decisions and they would not be so concerned and worried and fret. They would make the right decisions when it comes to what needs to happen in the United States and the relationships of the United States with the world. So this is such a golden opportunity that God has given. But you know it says there in Mark chapter 13 verse 11 that when we're taken before kings and rulers we should not even think about what we're going to say because the words that we speak will be given to us in that hour by the Holy Spirit. But of course we need to put the words in in order for the Holy Spirit to get them out. Amen. We're also told that the Holy Spirit guides us in our daily activities. You know the book of Acts is particularly interested, uh, interesting on this point. Uh, many times we find in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit would directly whisper to Paul and say Paul don't go there yet. Or Paul I want you to go over here. There's a group that needs witnessing to. That's an amazing thing. When you have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God directs you on what to do and what not to do in your daily life. And the Holy Spirit will keep us from making serious mistakes in our life. Allow me to mention just two more things that the Holy Spirit does. First of all, you're acquainted with the fact that the Holy Spirit gives us the gifts. You know what the gifts are? Evangelism, teaching, healings, tongues, you know the list. All of the gifts of the Holy Spirit come from that one source, the Holy Spirit. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit, how many gifts are you going to have? You're going to have none. You're not going to be able to do anything in the church. Is that perhaps the reason why there's a lot of people in the church that are doing nothing? I just throw out the question. 
And then of course, the Holy Spirit gives us the fruit of His life. He gives the fruit of the Spirit. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit, what don't you have? You don't have the fruit. And by the way, what is the fruit? Let's read about it in Galatians chapter 5, in Galatians chapter 5 and verses 22 to 25. Gal Galatians 5 verses 22 to 25. Here the Apostle Paul is addressing the fruit of the Spirit. It says in verse 19, and we'll begin at verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, do any of these people who commit these things actually have the Holy Spirit? No. The flesh is ruling. But now notice verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. Let me ask you, are the fruits of the Spirit, or is the fruit of the Spirit rather, because it's one fruit, is the fruit of the Spirit manifested in this way in our lives? I think it's a question we need to ask ourselves. Because if we're not seeing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, perhaps it's because we have not committed our life to the Holy Spirit. Because if we had, we would have the fruit that gives evidence that we have received the Holy Spirit. You see folks, technically speaking, we can't even say that we have the Spirit. The important thing is that the Spirit have us. Ellen White says that we're not supposed to use the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is supposed to use us. And the only way that this can happen is if we have received the Holy Spirit in our lives. I'd like to read a couple of statements from the Spirit of Prophecy on the reason why to a great degree the Holy Spirit is absent from the lives of so many that profess to follow Jesus Christ. Desire of Ages, page 672. Christ has promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to His church. And the promise belongs to us as much as to the first disciples. There are many who believe and profess to claim the Lord's promise. Notice, there are many who believe and profess to claim the Lord's promise. They talk about Christ, and about the Holy Spirit, yet receive no benefit. They do not, now notice, they do not surrender the soul to be guided and controlled by the divine agencies. Where is the problem? They do not what? Surrender. You know in most battles, victory is not gained by surrender. But in the Christian life, victory is gained by defeat. It's gained by surrender. When you surrender yourself, it says, okay, this self can't do it. I give up. Then Jesus kicks in. They do not surrender the soul to be guided and controlled by the divine agencies. We cannot use the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is to use us. Through the Spirit, God works in His people to will and to do of His good pleasure. But many will not submit to this. The whole problem is that we don't make a total surrender. We keep part to ourselves. And if you keep a few weeds around in your garden, sooner or later the weeds will take over the whole garden. Is that true? You don't have to be a farmer to know that. 
but many will not submit to this they want to manage themselves this is why they do not receive the heavenly gift only to those who wait humbly upon God who watch for His guidance and grace is the Spirit given the power of God awaits their demand and reception this promised blessing claimed by faith brings all other blessings in its train I love that statement this one blessing brings all of the other blessings in its train it is given according to the riches of the grace of Christ and he is ready to supply every soul according to the capacity to receive one more statement in heavenly places page 113 we find these words there is one blessing that all may have who seek for it in the right way it is the Holy Spirit of God and this is a blessing that brings all other blessings in its train if we will come to God notice this if we will come to God as little children why did Jesus say we're supposed to become like little children? excuse me, he's not saying that we should become childish we should become childlike there's a difference what characterizes a child? simplicity isn't that right? simplicity, you know, you have a child you don't have a child ask you little child Dad, do you really think the flood was possible? Uh, Dad, do you really think, how is it possible for Jesus scientifically to have walked on the water? You never hear that. You tell the stories in Sabbath school, the kids say, wow, that's amazing. But then we get a little bit older, we study, we get our PhDs and we think we're quite sophisticated a little bit too advanced for these childish things where education is supposed to make us ever more humble education puffs up knowledge puffs up the Apostle Paul said and we think we know more than God and we want to dictate to God and we want to draw our own path but Ellen White says if we will come to God as little children asking for His grace and power and salvation notice this, not for our own uplifting we're to ask not for our own uplifting but that we may bring blessing to those around us our petitions will not be denied then let us study the Word of God that we may know how to take hold of his promises and claim them as our own she says then we shall be happy what is true happiness? most people think that true happiness means having a luxurious car a fancy house lots of money in the bank a good wardrobe a position of fame and dignity all of these artificial things that matter nothing because all of that is going to burn up and real soon folks we're talking about soon we are on the brink of eternity today as we look at what's happening in the world and in the church and so you know we think about all of these all of these things, all of these riches that we have, and you say, this is going to make us really happy some of the most miserable people in the world are the richest see things, position, power, authority does not bring happiness having the Holy Spirit brings happiness having that childlike uh, character where, where we depend upon God, we give up on ourselves, we submit to His will that's where it's all at and folks 
I believe that what took place on the day of Pentecost is going to take place again. And I'd like to read, you know, the title of this sermon is The Times of Refreshing. Next Sabbath will be part two of The Times of Refreshing. We're going to go back to the day of Pentecost and I'm going to show you that what happened back then is going to happen once again. The whole Roman Empire was turned upside down by this Christian movement that began in the upper room. And we are promised that when the end time is near, that God is going to pour out His Spirit and there is going to be a global worldwide preaching of the message that will reach not the Roman Empire but will reach the world. The question is, when is that going to happen? Well the fact is, let's just review what happened at Pentecost, we're going to deal with it a little bit uh, more extensively next Sabbath, Lord willing. You know for the disciples to receive the Holy Spirit they had to give up on themselves. Didn't they? They had to be emptied of self. They all had to be on the same page. They could no longer consider their possessions their own. If they saw a need in the work they said, hey, I'll give to that. The Lord will provide. The Lord will take care. In other words, their center of focus was changed from them to God and a world that was perishing in sin. And when they were in that condition, God poured out His Holy Spirit without measure. And you know the story. Thousands were converted in a day. First, many came out of apostate Judaism. Then they went and they preached to the worldlings, to the unchurched, if you please. And the unchurched came in. So you have two groups coming in. Uh, as a result of the preaching of these individuals who received the Holy Spirit. You have, first of all, the apostates within, within those who claim to be the people of God, and then secondly you have those unchurched people in the world that begin accepting the message. Thousands baptized in a day. And you know that this was not some politically correct, timid, half-hearted message. The Bible tells us that Peter and John preached with boldness, with boldness. Thousands converted in a day and immediately persecution rises. Have you noticed that? Immediately after chapter 2 and chapter 3 Peter and John heal this man and they end up in jail. They end up beating him. Why? Because they received the power of the Holy Spirit to preach. Now allow me to read you a couple of statements from Ellen White in closing. She says, the prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign, that's the day of Pentecost, at the opening of the gospel, are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. So the prophecies that were fulfilled in connection with Pentecost will be fulfilled also at the end of time. One other statement, Great Controversy 6.11 and 6.12, she says the great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. Here are the times of refreshing, which we'll discuss next Sabbath, Lord willing. Here are the times of refreshing to which the Apostle Peter looked forward when he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and He shall send Jesus. Then she speaks about the fulfillment of this promise. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. 
Once again folks God will have a group of people like those who were in the upper room at the day of Pentecost. People who are totally emptied of their agendas, of their ideas, and their methods. And totally committed to Jesus. And Jesus is going to use that generation to proclaim that message of Revelation chapter 18 verses 1 to 4. A message of power. Jesus had said to the disciples, you will receive what? Power and you will be my witnesses. Revelation 18 speaks about an angel that descends from heaven. The whole earth is enlightened with his glory and we're told that this angel comes down with great power. And as a result thousands upon thousands we're going to notice will come out of the churches that claim to serve God but don't. There you have the parallel to Judaism of Christ's day. And thousands upon thousands of people who do not profess religion, unchurched people, will come out and join the movement. Thousands upon thousands will be converted in a day when God's people lend themselves to the infilling of God's Holy Spirit. And then of course we know what this is going to produce. It's going to make Babylon angry. And as a result you will have one final persecution against the people of God in the time of trouble. And then God's people will be delivered by the voice of God. Are you looking forward to that day? Are you happy? Are you happy at living here in this world? You like this place? You like the San Joaquin Valley? Where every day you look at the news and it says, oh air quality poor. Water quality poor. Of course not. It's time to go home folks. God isn't waiting because he wants to wait. He's waiting on us. And as I began the sermon today, I believe that God is working in a marvelous way today, especially among our young people. And I pray to God that our young people will give an example to the old folks. That's a strange twist, isn't it? Usually it's the old folks who say, I have the experience, you follow my example. Well in this case, the adults are going to have to follow the example of the kids. Praise the Lord for that. The scary thing is that Ellen White has said that when the Holy Spirit, when the latter rain falls, it'll be falling on people all around certain individuals and they won't even realize that it's falling. I pray that that will not be our case. That we will make a total commitment to Jesus. Lord that we will pray without ceasing. That he will give us this greatest blessing of all blessings. This blessing from where all other blessings flow. The blessing of the Holy Spirit. And that as a result God can use us as his instruments for this magnificent close of human history for the salvation of thousands and thousands of souls that will stand on the sea of glass and sing that glorious song of redemption in honor of the Father and in honor of Jesus. Do you want to be one of those people? Do you want to raise your hand? You want to be one of those people? Raise it high! Don't be embarrassed. You know now's the time, not the time to hide our colors. Now's the time to show the world who God's people are and what our message is. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we realize that the greatest gift that you have ever bestowed in history is the Holy Spirit. We've studied that the Holy Spirit does practically everything when it comes to the Christian life. Therefore if we don't have the Spirit we have absolutely nothing. Father I ask that you will take these words that we've studied and that you will write them in each mind and in each heart. Help us to reflect and think about these things in the course of this week. Help us to make decisions that will last on to eternity. Help us to place everything on the altar of sacrifice. Help us Lord to spend that daily hour contemplating the life of Jesus. And Father I ask that in that great day when Jesus comes when he takes us to heaven to the sea of glass I ask Father that 
none of those who are gathered here this morning might be missing in that great day. Oh Father, what a tragedy if we gain the whole world and lose our own soul. So I ask Lord that you will be with us and you will answer this prayer. For I ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.